Nigeria is a country that gave me what um, I could never dream to have. Anybody who knows me, my story is one that is very curious. I came from nowhere. When I say nowhere, I mean as in capital nowhere. I, I was brought up in the village where you wake up by 5 a.m. to go and fetch water from the stream. I, I brought, brought up by my grandmother. By the time your mother sent you to her mother in the village, man, it's like the last bus stop. And um, um, by right, I should probably be a pan wine tapper somewhere in the village and things like that. But uh, from nowhere, I, I, I gained admission into a school in Nigeria, Federal Government College Wari, and that school changed my life forever. And um, where I am today is where people would even find it difficult to as much as um, dare to dream in the sense of um, how God has been so good to me. I, there's so much I could talk about myself uh, in terms of um, profession-wise or social interaction or even financial disposition. In every sphere of life, I've been so 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 um, endowed by God that um, and all this trace back to the, the education that my country gave me and to that end I think it would be the height of um, of disservice to this country if I did not give back a hundred and fifty percent so for me it's like payback time Nigeria is a disappointment to the world. I say that with every sense of responsibility for two reasons, three, four, five, I don't know. Let me start from the position globally. Nigeria is the biggest black nation. It's like the capital world of the black nation. And that is no mean feat. Nigeria is blessed with so much resources not just natural anything that you think in terms of what you can get from the natural whether it's the the the, the mineral resources uh, people talk about crude in nigeria crude is just one little part of nigeria if you go to the northern part of nigeria gold diamond there's hardly any mineral that you cannot find in nigeria and then you look at the vegetation, you look at the climate of Nigeria, it's like a dream. We excel everywhere. You go to the US, we are the most enlightened, the most educated immigrant you know, community. And it's about the same thing in any country that you go to. Nigerians are, are just, they're just um, trailblazers, right? So when you put all these things together and then you come into Nigeria, you are expecting to see heaven. And the reverse is the case, you know. Uh, so, so to that extent, you realize that people are so, people like me are, are so unhappy. We are so challenged. And, um, you know, the history, how this got to be is not difficult to see. But the point is, we're here, we're here. What can we do going from here? I think that's really the point. What we can do is, um, you know, we have a very smart set of people. You know, there's this thing about native intelligence that is just, 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 just it in Nigeria. There's a group of people that we call politicians. They have mastered us like the back of their palms. They know how to manipulate us. They know the things to tell us keep away and let them do what they are doing. So the first thing is that they tell the elites, they tell the enlightened people, politics is a dirty game, don't get involved. And if you try to get involved, they smear you. And the smear campaign is such that they just, they just look, I'll tell you a little story that will, that will, that will um, blow your mind. Uh, a guy was doing very well. He got into the political sphere. He's been helping his people. He wanted to do politics. So what did they do? They realized that if we allow this guy to go to the polls, he's going to win. So what they did was they just jumped his fence and um, slaughtered um, um, a goat, okay, and let the blood be there. 
And then the day of the election, they brought the, the police that they had intel that the man was doing ritual killing. So they got there and there was the blood on the ground. And of course, the man was taken to the police station. So he could not be there. I mean, with such a thing, you can't, what's the election? You've got to go and answer. And only by the end of election, you know, they now came back and said, oh, sorry, we've done tests of it. It's actually not um, human blood. It is that of a goat. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is that the election has gone. The man has been disfranchised. He came from the U.S. and he can't wait to go back, rush back home. Go, don't go near politics in Nigeria. It is dirty. These guys will do anything to you. So they are able to scare off the people that can make the change. What do we have today? What we have is, you know, there's, there's a line that, that draws between politics and governance. Governance that is based on, you know, the fundamentals of, 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 of progress, of success, you know. When we are able to do this, then we are able to harness the resources that we have as a country and do the right thing the right way so we get the right result. And I want to tell you that in less than two cycles, two political cycles, let me say maximum three, in less than 12 years, Nigeria can come and become the envy of the globe because all we need is here, and that's the simple truth. When you heard that there was this, 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 this terrible um, sickness, call it that, you know, as at that time it was in the pandemic, but there was this terrible, you know, sickness that 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 was. Um, that was ravaging people in China, Wang Hu. And you realize that the first thing you should realize that there is a strategic relationship between Nigeria and China. Then you ask, them, how is it transmitted? And they tell you the way it's transmitted, airborne, and, or you know, the way it's transmitted, you realize that there's a high risk because you institute the protocols. Now, we didn't do that until there was the first index case in February, about three months after, we were still telling stories until it became a problem. And at that time, we started running around like headless chicken. It didn't make sense. As far as I'm concerned, it didn't make sense. And again, when we had said, shut down our borders, we started thinking, not as leaders, but as politicians. Oh, my friend is still in, in, in Dubai. My, 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 my children are still in Canada. When is your school closing? Uh, Minister of Defense or Minister of Aviation, please delay by another three weeks so that my family will be able to come back. You know, we put primordial personal in, you know, sentiment far above the interest of the nation. When you tell people, wear your face mask, these are things that are alien to us. What do you say? Oh, bros, cover your mouth and your nose. Where is a bros? Cover mouth and nose. We know that whatever comes in must cover mouth and nose. But when you say wearing first mask, it becomes like a statistical thing. We're really not seeing this wearing first mask. And it's sad because we need to wear the first mask. But you see, the communication channels and processes, even the way we have tried to do it, we have not localized it. So for us, it's still that Oibo thing. And um, I think that um, the vaccines are coming. Yeah. And what are we doing? I think that, um, like I said earlier, there are some states that can afford the infrastructure to have the visor, you know, vaccine with um, temperature minus 70 degrees. And um, there are some other states that cannot afford that um, infrastructure. So you can't really come and say everybody we must work best on a certain template. You have to look at the peculiarities. So I believe that the governors are doing well by wanting to um, embark on their own um, uh, accessing of the uh, vaccines based on their peculiar circumstances and needs. Also, the number of um, people affected, they vary per state. So the states that feel that this is actually a major problem to them are likely to want to put in a little more money. And there are some other states that feel they are really not as much affected as others, uh, going by the numbers and the testings and everything. So that is on one hand. But the ones that have been procured by the federal government, what bothers me is um, how opaque that they are getting about the system of um, distribution. And I want to say that unless they prioritize the health workers, 
if for any reason the health workers feel disenfranchised and they start to like play safe i think that's going to be a terrible situation but when they feel that they have been properly accommodated it might not go through all of them but just that feeling that they have been properly accommodated is going to be some kind of um like we put in nigerian parlance a, a, a parlance a, a, a ginger for them which is more like um uh, getting them more inspired and motivated that's a better word for it so i think that um, we should really come clean with this matter and um, pay more attention to the health of the people and not so much on how much we are going to make and i think that again finally the the rate to which we 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 embark or execute some of this um, agenda uh, tend to give the impression that we are just um, kotoing to, to the international community. I, I think the international community will respect us more if we show the peculiarities of our environment and then whatever we do is based on what suits us best. Uh, unless there's an ulterior motive, I think that the international community should be more concerned about how we can effectively deploy what we have to stop the, the pandemic as far as um, Nigeria is concerned. We should stop fooling ourselves. I'm 57. I'm a grandfather. My grandchild is already three years going to four. I am not youth. <laughs> no, I'm not. And we need to tell ourselves, by the time you have crossed 35, you need to start planning exit strategy. You get to 40, we start to tolerate you. By the time you get to 45, for goodness sake, please, 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 you are no longer youth. But that said, I, 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 um, I have a special thing in my mind for the young people. The reason is that we have lied to them for too long. I remember in 1985, I was in the UK. And um, my, my life changed to a great extent. I think there was um, um, a, a, a helicopter crash, something like that. And three, three of the people were involved. Um, uh, if I get my, uh, my, my these things right, uh, one of them was about 19, another person was 21, the other one was like in between. And each of them, two of them were, were actually married, they had kids, okay? And I thought to myself, these are people 21 and their parents. And here we are at 20, you are a small boy. At 25, you are a small boy. And I, I was, I was um, below 20 at that time. And it got me really thinking. And I sat down and I realized that I got to change my, my lifestyle. And that put me on a different frame of mind. So I had my first degree at 21, my master's at 23. At 24, I did my national service. At 25, I wedded. I actually wedded at 25. At 30, I'd had my three children, okay? So because I had a plan, my plan was that at 50, I wanted to have my three children, you know, as graduates. And the only way I could do that was to have my last child when I was 30. And if I wanted to have two children, I needed to marry at 25. So I worked it back to when I was um, a teenager and that gave me that inspiration and I walked towards it and, it and it worked and it's one of the best decisions that I made that I've made in my life here I am at 54 or uh, 57 at 50 my three children had actually graduated from university so it's just my wife and I at 53 I became so the peace I enjoy now I'm not doing school runs or thinking about to pay school fees any school fees I pay is just it's not obligatory it's not mandatory it is just a social service so to speak so I've, I've devoted my time to working with the young people for a mindset reset on one hand and then on the other hand we call it um, you know training for reigning I believe that our, our young people are our future and to that extent or to that end uh, it is up to us to train them to empower them so I actually devote myself that's why in Nigeria today I'm called the national youth headmaster and why it's youth headmaster is because man I carry the rod and I have the carrot you know I don't have just a carrot I have the rod big rod and I whip them into line and um, you know in the UK you may not understand the headmaster concept because 
of the educational system. But we have this, um, you know, primary school after nursery, but basically a lot of people don't go to the nursery. It's a primary school before you get into secondary school. So that um, the head of that primary school is the headmaster, and the primary school is a molding stage. So uh, I'm called the national youth uh, headmaster because I, I actually whip the young people. Sometimes I have programs that I, I put them inside a hall and talk for four hours non-stop. You know, it, 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 it's a drain on me, but it, you, it, it, it's just to tell the youth that you can be focused. And they make certain sacrifices before we start the program. Number one is that you can only go to ease yourself. Number two is that your phone must be switched off. I cannot hear. Uh, so you tell the youth they can actually switch off their phones for a period of, you know, uh, four, four, five hours and nothing will go wrong. So we realize that by the time we go through a session, They've learned concentration because usually we have this um, fast food approach to life, you know, and it's over, and you know, we don't want to, it's like, it's like Twitter, you know, pepper, pepper, short quotes. And, but life doesn't work that way, man. Sometimes you've got to just sit down and learn the art of patience, learn the art of waiting. There are basic fundamental value systems that you've got to inculcate if you are going to bring out people that are world leaders because time comes as a leader when you need to sit through a conference. But you realize that these days, leaders come for the opening ceremony and they go away. And, and that's not, you need to be able to sit down on strategy sessions and sit down for four hours, for five hours. Sit down and just take a coffee break and come back and sit down all day. Now, these are the things we've got to start to train our young people. So I, I believe so much. Nigerian youth are the most risk. I've been around the world. When I say round the world, I mean I have been round the world. I, 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 I would say this. There was, there was a time that in three years, I went to the U.S. alone over 20 times. I, I, I went to South Africa nine times in one year. Okay, Malaysia, I can't count how many times I've been to. I'm on my sixth international passport. That means I've been around anywhere you can imagine, you know. Um, but I have come to establish without any iota of doubt that the Nigerian youth are among the most resilient, among the most resourceful, among the most intelligent, among the most articulate. These people, that's why, look, look, somebody said something and I found it interesting. He says, um, one of your achievements, he said, they asked him, what is your achievement? He said, living in Nigeria. That, like, living in Nigeria is one of his achievements. Uh, you need to be a man to be able to live in Nigeria. That's why when you get outside of the country, you just excel. Nigerians are just excelling anyhow, because this is a camp of some sort. It's a training camp. And um, I love Nigeria, by the way. I, I love to be here. The Nigerian youth, unfortunately, has grown to see the ill as the normal. I'll give you a little example. A little boy was going for a birthday party and the uncle was taking her there. It was about six, seven years. The police asked for this document, he brought out, asked for that document, he brought out, asked for the other document, he brought out. And, you know, this little child, I mean, time was going, his friends were calling. You know, he saw his uncle as being very stingy, very, very tight-fisted. What he should do? He just called uncle, give him 20 naira, let's go. You know, what does that mean? Just, just tip, just give them the money. Let's go because that child has grown with the mentality that this is the proper thing to do, and that this uncle is just being stingy. On the other hand, the uncle is a man who believes that the police should do their job. They should not be given tips. You know, not even tips. This time it's bribe. You know, because like you're bribing your way. He thinks that's the proper thing to do. The little child has been taught to believe that. Look, you just go there, tip some money, and you're off. Now, when a child grows up with this mentality, how does he start to see 
evil and see good, how does he sift between what is right and what is conventional? So a lot of times we, we have expectation of the young people and we've not asked ourselves what have we put in them based on which you should have the expected outcomes. So I think that um, in the political system, the young people have come to see politics as something that really doesn't belong to them. They've come to see politicians as, the, as people that they have to kowtow to, people they have to claim loyalty, allegiance, because the, the older people have created a dependency syndrome, very, very, um, what's very, very conveniently so, and they have so reduced the, 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 the the, the value of the young people uh, so that they, they can get them for, for next to nothing. As a result, you cannot empower somebody that you want to use as a slave. So our youth are not being empowered. You are dislocating the educational system. So our youth are not getting proper education that leads to enlightenment, which is the biggest form of empowerment. Because if you don't know, you don't know. So these things are the things that we, the older ones, like what you've been trying to do, uh, are things we have to do on the double to start to set up schools to train, to enlighten the young people, to show them the alternate side of life, to let them see the inevitable concomitant of the way they are going, that they have no future, to let them know that they can actually be the leaders if they can make little sacrifices, if they can lead to interrogate the system. You, you want me to do this, why do you want me to do it? Okay? And uh, you ask yourself, sometimes you strip your future to enhance your present, okay? You, you can tell somebody who wants to pay you this little 10,000, 5,000, and then you can say, sir, I, I need money, I know it's good, but I want to ask you, really, what is your policy? What's your dream? What's your vision? What's your plan? What's your strategy? What do you want to do? You want to be a governor? Good enough. And it tells you, oh boy, give them 10, 10,000. And they say, sir, we need the 10, 10,000, but we just want to know what your game plan is. By the time you do that, people are compelled to go back and sit and think. And then we now start to have a political process that is informed. After the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, or let me say, after God, the next most important institution is government. just paid my bills but it's giving me the comfort of life and um, it's giving me national and international recognitions and things like that for instance in 2014 I was uh, made the housing man of the year in the Federal Republic of Nigeria when you do something like in Nigeria I'm also called Mr. Social Housing I pursued there wasn't a word a mention of social housing in Nigeria it didn't exist in our whole national housing policy I handled and pursued that for 20 years and eventually some years back when the national housing policy was to be made, reviewed, updated, I was privileged to be um, the vice chairman. And today I can say with every sense of responsibility, modesty and gratitude to God that social housing is a full chapter in the approved national uh, housing policy, chapter 8. And not only that, it is a flagship of the federal government right now as we speak. Social housing, everybody likes social housing. That's why they call me Mr. Social Housing in Nigeria. So that is on one hand. But then one has to look at the peculiar environment we are in and um, look at the concept of home. We have state of the art, um, you know, CCTV around and everything, night vision, everything. So you can actually drop um, any a coin except the breeze or not the breeze, except dust gathers on it. You can actually see who picks it any time of day, including midnight. So that's secure, aside from being a gated estate and so many facilities. The second S is serene. We have devoted so much time to open spaces, landscaping, and you can see, and we can achieve that in three years because before we even laid the foundations, we laid the long in living where you want to walk from home. So we want to have a, a smart estate where everything that 
pertains to technology, internet, uh, at the fastest possible uh, pace is um, what we are having. So we want to be able to get our young people to come, even our companies, to come to the point where you can work from home, which is the new normal. So you want to, we want people to, to stay in this estate and be, and be, and be, out, be outsourced, you know, projects from India, from China, from America, from UK, and they are working from here because the world has become a global village. So that is, and for me, I find that very exciting. And uh, virtually everybody that has come here has said, wow, this looks good. And it's a partnership with the federal government. So I need to give the federal government kudos. To those in diaspora, there's this little saying, a poem, uh, that East or West, home is best. And um, because of how much I've traveled, I, 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 I feel the pains of a lot of people who are outside the country. You can tell them, oh, I'm a British citizen, or oh, I'm an American citizen, and the rest. But the fact is that, man, you never really accepted. <laughs> Let's face it. And you wish that home was good enough. At the back of your mind, it's like, I hope home was good enough. That's on one hand. On the second hand, see this country as a place that they can no longer just wait and watch it happen. They are networking with. Look at when we had this, um, you know, the Lekki issue or NC. The, the, the reception, the reaction from the diasporans just showed that that enough is enough, you know, built up, uh, you know, bottled up uh, emotions and sentiment. So the next bottling or unbottling or uncocking of the sentiment is in the political sphere. And I just want to call everybody in diaspora and say, look, Nigeria can be, can be uh, uh, where people go to.